So time series, so why is it so popular, so common? It's because you can think of anything that kind of change over time, you would have the time series. So time series is just mean data over time, right, in some sense. And where at each time point, the data could be a single value. It could be a high dimensional uh, data point. So as in an image, I think of like video that is a time series of images. Right, where at each frame is an image. And of course, on an image, how you want to represent it, you can represent every single pixel as one dimension, that's up to you. Or you can do dimensionality reduction, or you can do feature extraction, and then that becomes a reduced number of dimension. But still, at every single time point, uh, you still have this data. So it depends on what that particular data point, then your time series is time series of something. So time series of images, time series of values, and so on. Right? And uh, often we represent uh, these as uh, X again for the for the for the values uh, X series Y series Z series and so on. So it could be one or more sequences. So think of it: if the um, one movie is X, right, and then another movie could be Y, and a third movie could be Z, and so on. So all these would be time series. And um, uh, the task there for uh, dealing with time series and very similar to any other kind of data that you'll be dealing with. So same kind of problem, high level problem, you want to find similar things. So when you have time series, then what are other similar time series? As in you have like stock prices, let's say. So each stock price is or stock ticker uh, over time, that's one time series. So how can you find other uh, stocks that are similar? And of course, why you want to do that? Well, if you, you are able to find things that are similar and even better, if you know there's exactly certain lag between one stock and the other, then you can, whoops, you can do forecasting, right? Do forecasting, if you can do good forecasting for a stock price, that means you're gonna make a lot of money because if you, once you observe one stock, how it behaves, and you know exactly the lag that will happen uh, between one stock that you're looking at and the other stock that you would predict, well, then you can just buy and sell according to what you observe. So forecasting is a very big, big uh, 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 reason for doing time series analysis. Uh, finding patterns also, so sometimes may not need to do forecasting, but maybe just learn about uh, what's happening, discovery, like learning new things. So may, you may want to find groups of things, not only like one specific sequence, but cluster of things. And also maybe sometimes you want to find our, uh, anomalies, anything that are out of the ordinary. Like if you're looking at a like, network packet right, in, your, in, your, in a company, so, so maybe it's under attack, right? So then that will be outlier. So as we mentioned, anything that change over time is basically time series. So which is why you will see it almost all domains I can imagine in finance, in econ econ economic, like in the medical, like all these, um, especially these days, we look at uh, health devices, mobile wearable mobile devices, um, or like, um, more traditional uh, health signals like ECG, blood pressure, and so on. So those are all, all time series data. And these are increasingly becoming better. So you probably have uh, been reading the news, right? So you were able to collect these data about people, let's say, their heart rate over time, right? Or, uh, or uh, yeah, heart rate over time, you can detect, oh, there's something abnormal. Right? Let's say you're stationary um, at a location, but then your heart rate really, really fast. Something is wrong. So, um, so uh, a lot of implication potential use uh, for health uh, purposes. And also these days, uh, smart houses uh, or a smart home, like all of these devices, even light bulbs, now you have uh, chips in it, right? So to, to then measure a lot of things, looking at the brightness, looking at humidity, and all these things. And of course, traditionally, use could be video surveillance. So, so if you say doing visual surveillance, you are actually analyzing the time series of images, which are video, uh, to discover anything out of ordinary is happening. Right? So many, many examples like this, and of course, most, most common, we do it every day. I mean, that's the reason why that you're wearing uh, heavy clothes is because, well, weather forecasting, right? The, now is pretty good. I mean, still sometimes something goes wrong, but overall we know, okay, today is very cold. So then you know what to wear, right? So all these, all these uh, uh, everyday examples of uh, if you're able to do successful uh, good time series uh, prediction, uh, pattern matching, though these are important application. I will think about more, artificial systems, uh, like computer systems, are uh, looking at uh, networks, looking at your disk uh, read and write, so all those are uh, time series as well. So how, how was it this uh, traffic, how much information is read over time, and uh, for security purposes, that might be important. So if you say, oh, you want to detect if uh, someone is illegally ex uh, exfiltrating information from your company, right? So there you may want to detect uh, anonymous, anomalous uh, search of uh, um, 
uh, network traffic right, right before someone who is going to get fired from a company, let's say. Right? So those are, those are also potential uses. So what are some key problems? So we also give you a high level, like finding similar things, right? doing prediction. So what, do, what does it mean? Uh, how do you translate it into more technical description? Right? So the, for example, like what are the, the more formal problem definition for it? So if you are doing a, a prediction, right, or you're finding a pattern, you can think of it as given a signal or given a time series data. Let's say you're looking at network packets over time, right? So, and given those, you want to find patterns. You want to find the periodicity, things that repeat. Um, and so the example would be like this. You have in this time varying value. Here's only one single value right, over time. But as I mentioned, it can be uh, multiple or higher dimension uh, value at every single data point. Right. So more technically, you can think of it as if you are doing forecasting, then how do you cast that problem? The problem will then become having your time or giving you a, a signal, which is a time series. Um, and you have a lot of values in the past. So let's say all these we are dealing with is uh, packet, network packet over time. So vertical axis would be the number of packets that are sent. And then horizontal axis, it, it would be uh, time tick, like what's the time point, like first second, second second, third second, and so on. So I have every time point, how many packets are sent. So these are historical information that you, you want. And your task here, if you're doing forecasting, is you want to predict, OK, at t plus 1. So what, what's happening? So you know what's happening at xt, xt minus 1, and so on, all the way. And now you want to predict what's happening at xt plus 1. So that's a more of a technical way of describing it. Right? When we result do forecasting, what does it mean? So you want to figure out what t plus 1, right? the, the information that you don't have at the time point that you care about. And if you're doing a similarity search, then the problem is what? So you're still given the um, given the, the, the data there. And but here, you might want to say, instead of doing pre exactly predicting what happened in the future, you want to say, given one pattern that you want to look for, where do you see it? Right. So um, yeah, where does it happen in the past? When is the most recent one, the next most recent one, how many there are? So it's like, like like difference. And uh, sometimes you may not do the extending that further if, if the uh, similarity pattern that you want to find is not um, actually one uh, sub pattern of the whole series. But in this case, you say, oh, I want to find what are some other sequences, time series uh, that are exactly the same or very similar to what you are looking at. Then uh, the problem there, then you will be finding what are the correlated time series. Right? So uh, here you are. We are, we are looking at, again, network packet. So each one is network packet. And now, but we have actually three related uh, uh, time, series data, time series data about network packet. Uh, in red, we call them uh, packets that are sent by a computer. In blue, uh, net packet that are lost. And then in green is a packet that repeated. So we are actually here describing uh, the TCP IP protocol. I'm not sure who has taken network network class, network computing class? Oh, very few. OK. So, um, so you use this uh, every day. So TCP IP is one of the networking protocol. So whenever you use the internet, so you are actually already using it. So TCP IP protocol so ensure that when you're requesting information, let's say from a server, let's say you stream video. right? So um, I guess video may not be using TCP IP. So let's say you visit a website. Now, if it's a website, you need to download website uh, content from a website. Um, when you're downloading information, streaming information, website, so often uh, those information get lost during transit, like for a variety of reasons. Sometimes hardware problems, sometimes network congestion, and so on. So that means even though you think you're requesting uh, information from a website, downloading data, like images, and so on, website, uh, doing that transfer, often things get lost. So the question is, how do we make sure you receive what you request? So. Let me see, in terms of this chart, so if you're requesting thing from a server, and this chart will be describing what the server is sending to you. So in red, so you think of these would be the traffic uh, leaving the server going to you. So it's, it's sending quite a few, like maybe a few images, and maybe it's less things and then over time. But then some of that, what the server send would be lost, so which is shown in blue here. Um, so variety of reasons, sometimes heavy server under heavy load, so it's not responding to you. So um, those things get lost. Or maybe in the middle, a router goes down, so things get lost. 
So that actually happened. But then you say, wait, wait a second. So when I go visit a home page or web page, I always get back what, what I requested. So what do you mean that it's locked? The reason is that because for TCP IP protocol, it has a fail safe. So it makes sure that if uh, the information doesn't reach you, like from the server doesn't reach you, then it will retry. So which is the green uh, uh, time series here. So it will retry. Actually, we will try a couple of times. If the first time you try once, try to resend the same thing, if it still doesn't reach you, it will try again. It will increase the time and uh, uh, delay, but eventually, hopefully, it will send you. But there, there will always be a threshold, so, which is why still there are times where that you request something and you still get a, a blank page or a page that's not fully loaded. But generally, when you are visiting a, a web page, uh, you're requesting, eventually you do get it, like maybe sooner or later, uh, maybe not immediately, maybe a few seconds. So that is what the TCP IP protocol is happening. So, so all the three uh, time series here is just describing what the server will be sending to you. And these time series are correlated. So, so just visually you'll see, ah, okay, well, so red is what the, ser what the server has sent, and then blue is how much of that was sent, which is how much proportion of the red one that's lost. And not surprisingly, it should be much lower, right, than the red one. So much lower over time, uh, hopefully as, as slow as possible. And, and as we said for TCP IP, if it, it does lose some packet, then it will try, retry. And retry there's some delay, right? Because once you find out, oh, there's, you didn't receive it in two seconds, and then after two seconds, you resend. So that's a lag. So it's just what happened for the green one. And it would be correlated with the lost line because if nothing's lost, you don't send it, resend it. Only with something's lost, then you resend. Which is why the green one, the repeated one, is lagging uh, behind the blue one. So there's strong correlation between all these lines, actually. So of course, for TCP IP, you already know that these are exactly the things that you're measuring. But now imagine no one tell you that. They just tell you these three time series. And you need to find out which exactly three lines out of, I don't know, 1,000, 1 million lines that are correlated like these. So that's often the problems that you want to find. So think about this. Now generalize it to not packets, but now talk about like, stock prices. Right? So each line here corresponds to one company. So if you are able to find all these similar correlated stock prices, even better, if you can find actually exactly which stock price is lagging the other one. Let's say the green one, let's say it's Apple, right? And then the blue one, I don't know what you call it, uh, Google, let's say. But if you can tell that Apple always lag behind Google, then you are going to be a billionaire because, well, once you observe what Google is doing, then you know what to do with the Apple, either buy up or sell, right? So, so that's why finding correlated, especially like time lag, uh, uh, time series is very important, right? So that's, that's, this is one example, and you get the idea. So all these, all these are, are important problems. So there has been a lot of work uh, that, that are doing that. And so all involved finding patterns, finding rules, doing uh, forecasting, finding similarity, matching, even if it's like a small part of the time series or the whole thing, finding correlation. Right? And, and they are all intimately uh, correlated, uh, related. And because if you want to do forecasting in general, that means you need to find some kind of pattern. Because if you're able to find pattern, then you can say, oh, okay, so I see part of the pattern now, uh, the beginning part of the pattern now, that means the next time step, probably uh, that's what's going to happen um, uh, according to what we know. Right? Um, and also by finding pattern, you can also find outliers. We have seen this many times. Right? So why do we need large amount of data? Why do we need to do mind pattern, because you have pattern that you know what doesn't fit, the, fit those pattern, then you know what are outliers, what might be special things. It could be special case, it could be actually insight, potential insight that you, uh, new knowledge that you don't know about, right? Outliers, finding special things. So we'll start with uh, uh, looking at some of the uh, key components when you do time series. Uh, what do we need to care about? Like when you're doing forecasting, doing simulated match matching, what do we need to do? So here, uh, another uh, uh, visiting of the similarity search or similarity uh, function that we see it again and again and again. We see it many, many times already uh, in network, in, in uh, text analysis, uh, or even machine learning when you're doing clustering. So eventually you need to decide on how do you determine similarity? So uh, same thing for time series too. So you want to find pattern, you need to know how to determine things, whether they're similar or not. So we look at similarity, uh, 
uh, function distance function. And particularly, we'll look at uh, two very popular ways of doing it. One is using uh, Euclidean distance, not so surprising. And the other might be uh, newer for you, and maybe in this context, something we call time warping. You might have seen this actually exact same algorithm in other situations, uh, not time uh, analysis, time series analysis, uh, but exactly the same method. So we'll look at these uh, first. All right, so distance function, uh, mentioned many times, so very, very important. Um, in practice, that there can be many distance functions that you may need to try, and these are not, not function, uh, distance functions that you can just say, hey, whenever you do time series analysis, just use that. You probably need to try. You can start, start with the more popular choices and see how, how it works. If it doesn't, then you need to try other. And as we mentioned also many times again, so how do, you, how do you test? The best way is to pick the distance uh, function and then using the task that you care about. So that means in the outcome. What do you care about the outcome? Using that outcome to, to measure. If you use this distance function, it doesn't improve the outcome and then versus using an other distance measure, it does improve the outcome, then that's the best way of doing measurement. Right? Uh, there's certainly some theoretical uh, uh, analysis about, about that, but eventually it's about how well uh, your method can solve the problem. Right? So it's very important. And we'll, as we mentioned, we'll look at the Euclidean and then the uh, time warping. So when we do similarity matching, that means that implies that we have to have at least two things that to measure, right? So here we're using a, an example, two example, just x and y, x is blue, y is red, right? Uh, how do we do the matching? So the easiest is you treat each time series as a tie, uh, high dimension data point. Right. And as in every value, you just uh, linearize it, let's say, right? or put it in one vector, and then now you just treat the two, uh, two time series as two vectors. And uh, if you do that, then, well, you can uh, use uh, all the, all the well-known uh, LP norm, L1, let's say, city block Manhattan, right? or maybe L2 Euclidean, or LP, um, or L infinity. Um, so that is a pretty common way. So we say, well, why do we do that? Like, why do we uh, look at a time series as an ND vector? Well, because that's easy to do it, right? So you go, okay, well, so that, that's, that seems to make sense. Right? You already have time point, uh, so why not we just start with that? It turned out that it does work pretty well uh, for a lot of times, if, especially if they are quite similar, you can, you can do that pretty well. So another way to interpret it right, in a in more geometric way is you know, each point is one dimension. So if, if each time point is one day, then that means you have n dates, right? and the n dimension, and then each time series here is one point in this n dimensional space. Right, and of course, if you do this kind of uh, representation, then similarity, then you can think of it as like computing cosine similarity or dot product between these time series, which is really looking at the ve vector. So nothing is really new here. It's just the, the way of thinking that you are doing time series analysis. If you never really think about how you represent a time series, then may, you may not even be, oh, okay, oh, actually I can actually use exactly the same thing that I already learned already. Right. So this t tend to work well if the time series, they are quite similar, then, so as in similar in shape, for example. In this case, this seems to work pretty, pretty well. It's mainly the, the main difference uh, between the value, maybe a little lower, a little higher. But in practice, like, what do you often see more common is that you, the, the time series that you're looking at, they may be lagging or maybe a little faster, a little slower. Uh, one is a little faster or slower than the other. Um, so that means we do need to think about how to uh, take into account these we call acceleration or deceleration. So everything example as in for the same, uh, so let's say audio clip. Audio clip is what time series of all these, uh, 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 what do we call it? Voice signal, so audio signal, yes. And um, I can say the same word much faster, uh, or I can say the same word, like much slower. So to every human being, you would consider those two fast and slow versions the same thing, right? But then if you really look at the, uh, the every single point, every single time, if you use uh, Euclidean distance, for example, then, then the difference is huge because uh, one is much shorter, the other much longer, uh, a lot more time point, and the values do not really align, right? So in that case, then you probably want to think about how to account for these acceleration and deceleration, right? So then think of it as one way of kind of stretching or compressing one of the uh, 
the time series so that you can match it to the other one. So um, time warping is one of the, the way to do it and allow for accelerated deceleration, try to match it as, pos as well as possible, and then still come compute, let's say, the Euclidean uh, distance. So now that things are more or less matched, um, and then you compute it. Right? And this is uh, exactly, almost exactly, the, the same uh, algorithm that you have probably seen in what we call string editing distance. So this is for uh, comparing how different two words are. So um, let's say, what is a good one? Mm, yeah, let's say compute, right? Compute. The word compute and the other word compute, computer. So computer has an extra R, right? Compute doesn't have that R. So using string editing distance, you can uh, look at how different those two words are. In uh, string editing distance, the usual way of doing it is to say, how do you turn one word into the other? So if it's computer and computer, then what? You add one character, which is R, so addition. So that is an addition and uh, addition operation. And you can say, oh, that's it. that is the, the main difference. And then similarly, you can say, we're well, taking a character out or maybe replacing a character. So those are the uh, common operation that you can use to say how, to look at how different those two words. So of course, the more operation you need, need to do, the more different. So the same thing here. So we're time warping. So wh what are the operation that will allow um, uh, to do so that you can turn one and the other. So there's a pictorial uh, way, very, very uh, hopefully easy to understand. So we have two time uh, waveform, so uh, red and blue. And just visually, you can see the, the blue one is going to kind of stretch out version of the, the red one, right? So it's a little bit uh, uh, going faster than the red one. So using uh, time warping, it will allow you to add these we call it stuttering or the repeating repetition um, or sometimes delay uh, into one of the time series. So here, if I zoom in a little bit, right? So what is it really doing here is we try and match the red and blue one. So if it's close enough, it's okay, we don't do anything. But it's like, ah, okay, so it's there's significant difference then you kind of add one or repeat one. So then uh, you stretch it, stretch it in time a little bit and then you add another one another one here and uh, eventually then they'll align pretty well right so that's the main idea so so that means that how do we compute uh, all these operations that you may need to do and on the operations the number operation and the kind operation that you do you can uh, consider that as like a, a part of the similarity measure right so again more operation you do the more different fewer uh, the, the more more the same so how do we compute it? And this is using dynamic programming and dynamic programming. And um, so this is where they, we get into a little bit more of the technical details. Um, so we have two time series that we want to compute or to compute the, the time warping uh, cost to match, we call it. And D is the distance uh, between the two time series. And usually we use X and Y, the two time series, and then we'll index those two uh, time series uh, with I and J. Uh, correspondingly. And here what i and j means is that for the first sequence x, when they say i, that means we're considering the first part of the x sequence all the way from the beginning up to the, the place i. And similarly, for the sequence y, when we say j, that means we're considering all the character from the beginning up until the position j of um, the sequence y. So that's how you how you interpret. So that means in other words, this is really considering how well do you match like the, the fragments or the segments of the of these two sequences, like uh, from the beginning to the end. Right? Of course, when i and j equals the length of x and y, then you are essentially computing the whole whole match, the whole sequence, how well to match. Right? So we'll look at the details a little bit, but I think it's informative to first look at the outcome, pictorial outcome, like what are we really doing? Right? So when you when you have, have these two. So this is a very good illustration uh, for you. Actually, I'm gonna show the, the website instead. Right from here. So pictorial way of showing what time warping is doing. Right, dynamic time warping, DTW. 
so uh, some intro text. So this is also uh, one we I would consider one of those like very self-contained one page uh, reference that is good to good to go back to. Um, and if you forget, then, then you, you have all the information in one uh, single page. So it says angel align two sequences feature vector of warping the time series iteratively into optimal match between the two sequences are found. So here they're using slightly different terminology. Instead of X and Y, they use A and B, but that's the same thing, right? So that means for time series, let's say A, sequence A, like this where my mouse cursor is, then you have all the value A, one, two, three, four, uh, up to J, so indexed by J, and then up to N. And similarly for B, time series B, here you rotate it a little bit. So 90 degree, right? The same thing. So it's B1, B2, BJ, and then to BM. Right, so here you say, what are we doing here? They're explaining the visualization. So you put sequence A, sequence B um, on the two sides, right? So one is rotated. And it's a both sequence start on the bottom left of the grid, right? So that means the beginning of sequence A is here, like on the left to the left, and the beginning of sequence B is to the bottom, right? Okay, so what we were describing here You see some dots over here, the red dot. So the red dots, by looking at the orientation, the uh, trajectory of the uh, the dots, you can tell what are we are doing to both sequence A and sequence B. Right. So here you can say inside each cell, a distance measure can be placed, comparing the two corresponding elements of the two sequence. So essentially, you can think of it, we're starting from the beginning, let B, the first value, uh, and the first value of a, how different or how how different or how similar they are, and does it need any stretching of one to to have it to match the other? So just visually, you can see like for sequence A in the beginning is very flat, right? So while for sequence B, is flat but only for one unit. So that means like one way to do to have B and A to match is that for the first value of B, you repeat it a couple of times so that it would match the flatness of sequence A, right? And if you do that, then now you can say, oh, okay, so that match pretty good. And now you can proceed to the second one, the second value, which is going up, up a little bit, right? And if you look at sequence A, oh, it's also growing up a little bit. So that means you don't need to do anything. You can just repeat the same thing. You can just, just use the same value, right? From A, where my mouse cursor is, and use the same value from B. So then that's where you can, you don't need to do repeat. That means you're going diagonal. You're just re capturing whatever values are. So this means that here, if you're going horizontal or using vertical, that means you're repeating either B or repeating A. If you're going diagonal, then you are just reading our value from A or reading our value from B simultaneously. So that means this gives you a very good visual representation of saying, okay, what are we doing here? So ideally, if it's a perfect match A and B, of course, it's diagonal all the way like from, from one side to the other side. If it's, oh, this is a little confusing, so even better, uh, visualization would be like this. So here, using the lines like to, to show the correspondence about what are we really matching, right? So again, A and B, and here using the line to, to connect the values. So here, you will see like three line going into the first value of the green one, uh, the B line. So essentially that means we, are, we have to repeat uh, this three times to match. And if it's going diagonal, let's just know nothing that's, that's connecting, that means you're just reading off doing the match. Right? You're seeing it's matching, matching at different time point. And at some point you might need to repeat uh, the blue, one, blue value to match the flat, flatness. And then now you can, you can do most of the reading again. Right? So this is what, what the algorithm is able to help you find. So what are we, what are we doing to these, uh, for them to match? So the very good uh, single, single, pretty self-contained uh, and article. So uh, if you're new to uh, dynamic programming, so the way to find it is, I think of it actually really by, uh, when, when people say compute the, the distance or the uh, dynamic time warping uh, distance between A and B, um, your first question to ask is, or what you want to ultimately compute is how do you match the whole uh, sequence? 
And the algorithm, uh, interesting thing is actually, it will uh, be kind of, you think of it as a backtracking. You're, you, when you say you're computing A and B, the whole distance, you're actually backtracking to what if we consider like B minus one, uh, sorry, uh, M minus one, N minus one, how well does it match? And then M minus two, N minus two, how, does, how well does it match? So it's actually reusing, um, incrementally reusing uh, results from earlier private computation. So if I were to write the full uh, algorithm down here, like how do you compute like uh, the two, matching the two time series, uh, X and Y, then this would be what, what I write out. So first series is X and the other is Y, right? And then you index by I and J correspondingly. And here, what do we want? We want to compute the distance cost to match between the two time series. And what we're we saying is that if we want to compute up to the prefix, that being the first segment, uh, the first uh, I values of X and up to the J values of Y, then what we were doing is, well, we would look at the, the match at the difference, value difference at that exact point, plus, whatever, so here's a, a switch you can think of it, whichever is smaller among the three possible options. So one option is you go, just go one step further, like for both of the times, you just go one, one step before, sorry, and go to I minus one and J minus one. So in other words, that means no repetition, you just read off the previous value. That's one option. And then the other is you repeat one of them. In this case, you repeat X, but you don't repeat Y, right? So and then you're just repeating this, let's keep the same one, but then the other one just read it off. Or the other option is you are repeating Y, but not repeating X. And of course, you if you look at it, well, this is a recursive uh, definition, right? Because if you want to compute these three, then what do you need to do? Now you need to apply this again, right? And that means you can actually look at all the all the possible uh, uh, ways, so the, which is what gives you all these. So essentially that means if you really want to compute the whole thing between A and B, uh, which another way to think of it, you want to consider all one to M, uh, one to N, everything. So essentially you're going back in time, going back to the beginning, what's the, what's the best way to match? And then uh, this will give you the, the best optimal uh, path going through that, going th through that matching process. Uh, this is exactly the same algorithm as in string adding distance. And of course, for string adding distance, often uh, the things that you want to compa compare is much shorter. So if you want to have two words, that's much shorter. Uh, but sometimes you may also want to compute uh, the whole paragraph, then you will end up quite a lot. But for uh, time series data, often it's, it's much longer. So this could be hundreds or even thousands, of, uh, but depending on time resolution. Uh, but, the, but the algorithm is still the same. And our time series, we do often care a lot about the uh, time complexity. So you want to solve it exactly, then is big O M times N. So M is the number of uh, time points in, and, and also N is the, uh, so there are two series. So M and N are the, are the uh, are length of those uh, two time series. So roughly you're thinking of it as quadratic if they're roughly the same. Um, so that means relatively expensive. So um, there are variation, quite a few, um, on on that, and as determining how you want to uh, uh, penalize the uh, the difference, right? So one way you can, one reason you want to think about how different way to penalize is because you can imagine this, you can always stretch one uh, time series into the other, given enough of those operations, right? Repetition, whether you repeat one or the other. So that means if you don't really limit it, it would give things that are really out of bound, right? So you can, you can stretch it or one, compress it. So the variation of the there is to say, well, certain um, very certain uh, operations are really bad. You shouldn't do it a lot. For example, uh, imagine we are comparing uh, voice, voices, voice clips, right? So you don't want to make one clip to be so slow that when you play it, you can't really hear anything, right? When, when you say things really slowly, you, you lose your content. Uh, similarly, when you're saying something really fast, 
Right? You also cannot hear what's happening. So that's corresponds to the practical use of these where, well, the, you can find a match, but then the match is not really good as in making things really fast, uh, really compressed, or really stretch up. So, so that's why you may want to penalize as in, well, if you are keep repeating, you want to impose a limit. How much do you want to want to repeat? And then we say, that's it. We don't want to want to uh, repeat that much or set a percentage, right? The, how much of that uh, audio clip you are or are not uh, 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 manipulating, right? So pretty, pretty common, pretty popular, uh, especially in voice processing. Um, so one of the fundamental uh, methods in it and, and often people use it as a pre-processing also. And then after that, they, they just still compute the kind of stretch version um, or the, the original version, uh, the, the two versions that you want to compare. Let me skip this one. Uh, so those are two very common uh, distance measure. So Euclidean's almost doing nothing, uh, where uh, there's a different way of viewing the the time series data as a high dimensional data point. And as we mentioned, uh, that it doesn't really ac account for the fact that some of the time series could be compressed or stretched out version of the other. So that's where time warping come in. Um, so also taking into account acceleration and deceleration. Right, so knowing how to compute similarity, so that is good. So how do we integrate it into uh, forecasting? So if we're able to determine similarity, well, then now we can help with like clustering. We can help with uh, prediction. So how do we do that? So there are two main kinds of uh, prediction or forecasting you may want to do. So you'll notice in time series often we call more like forecasting instead of prediction, but it's actually the same thing. Uh, the reason, the historical reason, because often when people are doing like uh, video analysis or maybe time series, they often uh, forecast the future. So that's historical reason for why it's called uh, forecasting. So uh, two primary way, one is linear, the other is nonlinear. Uh, linear forecast, we start with linear forecasting. And uh, you may already have seen variation of this method, again, so in, in different contexts, but now in, um, in time series analysis. And specifically, we can look at a method called auto regression. Um, you, I think most of you should have heard of regression. Anyone study linear regression? Linear regression, okay, a lot of hands, that's great. So auto regression is small modification of linear regression, which is great because if you know the basics, uh, you heard of it or you just remember it some, a little bit, then you, you would know auto regression pretty easily. So what are we doing, right? So we are doing forecasting, uh, so to refresh your memory. So we know historical data, like x t minus one, t minus two, and t minus c, and so on. And we want to forecast x t, what's happening. And usually there is some pre-processing you need to do, even for linear uh, broadcasting. Uh, one is you want to uh, remove general trend of your data, so that you're really looking at the variation rather than looking at the overall uh, trend. Uh, and also periodicity. Uh, sometimes you do actually want to keep the periodicity, so dependent on your application. So if you don't want periodicity, you might need to remove that. Uh, so some, some pre-processing. Uh, that you may need to do. So suppose you have done the pre, uh, pre, let's say, yeah, pre-processing, then now you can do forecasting, right? So as in predicting what happened at time t, given t minus one, t minus two, and so on. Right? So more formally, you write it out as what? We want to find xt, given xt minus one, xt minus two, and so on. So when you are doing linear forecasting, you are essentially making the assumption. So Knowing very well that assumption, it may or may not uh, fit reality. But if you are using linear uh, method, you are accepting the assumption uh, that is true, uh, which is that somehow you, when you are doing prediction for xt, so that means question mark over here, that you would agree that you can express it as a linear combination of the past up to a certain window. So as in xt, you will say it is some values, scalar values, multiplied by xt minus one plus some other scalar value plus minus uh, times xt minus two and all the way. Right? And this is linear combination of the past plus some noise. Allow some noise, that's not in a perfect match, that's okay. And this is a general form uh, when you're doing a linear uh, forecasting. 
So this assumption is acceptable, and you say, well, why do we want to assume this? Well, this is uh, easy to ana analyze, and also you can use existing method. And does it really match reality? We don't know. Sometimes it does. It does not work really well. But there are also times where it doesn't, which is why there is also nonlinear forecasting, which we will talk about shortly. But now we're looking at linear forecasting. So that means you're buying into this. We think it works. And variation of that, they say, oh, predicting the future. Oh, what if I uh, have a problem not really predicting future, actually filling in the gap in the past? As in, you have all the data that, most of the data you have, but there's some holes in it, some gaps in it, and you want to figure out what that is. So another way, in the word that expresses, you have XT, you want to predict XT, where XT now is the gap. And you have some data in the past, so and some data in the future. So that means here, you will have xt plus 1, xt plus 2, and up to certain window, and then xt minus 1, xt minus 2, and then up to certain window. Right? So that means you're having some window in the past, some window in the future, and then you do you want to fill in the gap. So uh, good news is that the algorithms are exactly the same. So whether you are filling the gap or creating a future is actually exactly the same thing, because again, you are expressing you'll be expressing this question mark as a linear combination of the past and a linear combination of the future. So that means the same, same uh, expression here. So just want to mention it because often uh, you know, people might think, oh, you're always doing forecasting. Not really. Actually, filling the, in the gap is the same method too. So how do we do that? So the uh, reason I mentioned uh, that if you know linear regression, that's great, is because we will be using variation of the small variation of linear regression. So do a refresher first, so in case you have a linear regression. Um, so we'll start with a low dimensional case, uh, how, how, how we are doing linear regression. So data here is not time series data. So here we're looking more uh, categorical, uh, sorry, uh, tabular data. Uh, each data point here is one person, like one patient, let's say. And when they check into the hospital, let's say we measure their weight and height. So patient number one, weight 27, height is 43, and so on. So of course, fictitious. Um, and we have n patients. All right. We know n minus one of them, so n minus one of them. And now we have a new patient come in. Uh, weight is 25. So the question for you is, what is his or her height? Right? Question mark. So you can plot this data, of course. So by now, whenever you have new data, the first thing you might want to do, oh, okay, plot the data and see what happened. Then you can have a scatter plot, like right? two axes, body weight, body height, this correspond to the two columns. So like each dot here then will be one patient. Right? So make Make sense, and you will see something like this for this fictitious data at least. Right. So what are we uh, doing here? So whenever you say, "Oh, this is looks like there is a trend," yeah. So you're right. So if you do running a linear regression on this, then it will help you find a line that can fit pretty well. I mean, based on uh, root mean square. Uh, error. Um, so how well and look at the difference if you do project this data point down to this this line that linear regression uh, does fine for you, then uh, it would be the best fit according to that error criteria. Right. So so that we think given that line, then we say what, what do we use? Why why do we do all these linear regression finding this line? The reason is that like, with that and now when you have a new point coming in, if you know one of the value. Um, then we can read off the other. Right? Let's say body weight is 25. Then what do you do? You come in to here, body 25, and you can project it to the line, and then you can read off uh, what the value, what the body height would be. Right? So very quick, uh, kind of 2D example showing you. Okay, so for uh, linear regression, what it can find you. So for a 2D case, you'll be finding a line to fit. In higher dimensional, it will be in 3D, let's say, then it's a plane. Now here, even higher dimension, there's a hyperplane. Right? But same idea, the plane, hyperplane, they, if it finds you, it will be the, the best fit according to the, the error criteria. Right. So why do we mention this? I did mention linear regression. Um, so for time series analysis, we actually have similar setting here. We still want to do some kind of prediction, some kind of prediction for this case of patient. So for our case, we what do we have? We have time series, right? We think of that. We have one time series. It change over time, value change over time, and we want to predict future. So how do we leverage this kind of setup, right? 
while we only have really one one uh, time changing or time varying value. Right? Another way to think about it is um, each data point, so each time point, is, is one dimension, right? So, oh, sorry, one value. So time is one, two, three, four, all the way to n, where n is the point that you want to do the prediction. But you know what happened uh, all the way from one up to n minus one. So that means you know the value, time point is 43, and then go up or 54, and then go, go up further, and so on. So you have that. So you say, OK, so I have a question mark, but how do we do something like this? That's clearly we need two at the minimum. Right, so so that we can draw a scatter plot, so that we can have a have a line and so on. So here, for our for our time series, we only have one. So what is the problem? So that is where why we have the word auto regression, it's called linear auto regression. Is so, well, so why don't we just clone ourselves? So we clone ourselves, we generate another version of your same uh, time series data, and specifically, this is a lagged version of. Uh, time series data. So that means at time equals two time tick two, you are also having another uh, dimension, which is the value at time uh, equals one. So same thing. You just really clone it and then you ship it down. So lack it by one. Well, another way to think about it, if you this is measuring what you're measuring a uh, network packet over time, right? So this is what you have, and you're generating another clone version of you, and uh, which is representing uh, then we're packing set and t minus one. So it's really shipped by one. So if you do that, then what, what will happen? Then you can do a scatter plot, right? So scatter plot, you kind of one axis uh, for your for your, your own value, the vertical axis here represents the value. And then the other axis is the lag version um, of yourself, right? And if you notice that the lag version here, we don't really have question mark because it's shipped by one and I only need to know one question mark. So it's, it, that's why I shipped it. So then with this, then what do we do? Right, so here we say lag is one, so it's just shipped by one. Then what can we do? So that means we are really, what we're representing is we want to represent the dependent variable. I'm sorry, the number of packets sent at T as the dependent variable. And then uh, the lag version uh, is the independent variable. So that means Given an independent variable, we want to predict what's the dependent variable is. So it, starting from this part, there's actually nothing new. So once you generate the, the plot, yes? Why is it t minus 1? Ah, why is it t minus 1 and not t plus 1? And so here, you, you would, uh, we'll talk very shortly. So uh, the lag doesn't, first doesn't need to be 1. It can be 2, 3, 4, and so on. And the other reason is, uh, this is by the construction. So what? how do you want to represent your uh, the two columns? So here we have our question mark in T, right? So in, in this column, at least. So we want to get rid of the, or we want to predict the question mark. So that means you want to express the question mark as what you know already. So what do we know is, well, we know the pass. So which is why is T minus one, which is the lagged version. Um, so I think it's probably easier to, under, to, to, to understand it as things that happened in the past. So you are yeah, representing future in the past. Yeah, it, correct. So the, the, the naming is uh, need a little bit uh, getting used to because when we say lag, often we need to say, wait, which direction is going? So a good way is to think of it's a history. So it's looking in the past. How, how far in history here we're looking at just one time point before, but you can also look at uh, two time point and three time point. Okay, so that means key idea here, we, we're having time series is, all we're doing is clone, clone ourselves, like ship one in the, in the history, in the past, into the past, then we can have two dimension, right? even though we have only one time varying value, we have two dimension, and then we apply the same thing, exact the same method, you do a linear regression actually, and, and then you can fit a line. Right? And we have a name for this plot, we call this the lag plot, uh, so lagging, uh, lagging plot, lag plot. And then now you want to do a prediction. So what do we do? Well, to predict prediction, then we use our history, the old value of 25. Do exactly the same thing. You go to the axis corresponding to the past, and you look it up. 
and then you, you can see what the value this one should be. Right. Actually, that's all it is. That was a very small modification. And then you say, whoa, does it work well? It actually, it worked pretty well. So this is uh, the, the method that often people would just go to because that's the easiest. When you have a method, does linear autoregression work? That, that means the linear linearity assumption, does it hold? If it works, then people just go with it. And of course, a lot of time it doesn't, then you try other methods. So work well a lot of times. And uh, there's some uh, things to consider, like even using this, this method, right? So uh, whenever, by now, like it's close to the end of semester, whenever you see these parameters, hyperparameters, then you should immediately ask this question, why w is one, right? So that's w greater than one works. So question, the answer is yes, it does. So whenever you have uh, a bigger window, like it means considering more of the history, then essentially you are, you think of it as drawing additional axes in the lag plot, right? So previously, what do we do? Here we consider just uh, lag by one time point, so which is why you have two dimension, right? If you consider W is two, you consider two times W four, that means you have uh, uh, the lag version shifted by one and then your lag version shifted by another, that means you have two axes, two additional axes. So that means now you have what? Three axes total, right? So the current value with the question mark, uh, lag by one, lag by two, and that means now each data point in there is three dimension. And you can think of it as also including more too, more dimension. So then that means instead of fitting a, a line, then you're fitting a plane or hybrid plane, depending how many there are. Right. So, and that also means that when you're doing prediction, what do you do? Then you are just using more of the history value during the lookup. Right. So and it's like, okay, so that, that seemed to uh, look well, uh, work well, or at least understandable. So how do we express it in now in math? Like what is the math that, that can help us solve? So if you already know linear regression, uh, then it's exactly the same method, um, not doing anything new. Uh, but we will look into a little bit of the, of the details, right? So we have our, uh, sorry. <laughs> we have our, uh, time series matrix, and that's constructed out of, uh, just a second. Yeah, constructed out of our, our time series, and here there's some, some of the symbols, so W is the window, so how, how many lagged version of, of itself you are using. Um, here we say W, and we need to figure out exactly how, how we want to weight the path. So which is why we have this A, uh, which is like a vector, right? And then Y would be the, uh, include the, what you want to predict using the history. So this is a little abstract, so we're looking at the pic picture, which is easier to understand. Right. So this is our time series, right, time series. Right. What do we want to do? Right. In the end, is we want to predict where my mouse cursor is the question mark. Right, so what do we want to do? And so now is how do we construct all this like out of just a version of the like, multiple version or segments of itself. So here's an animation to show you. So uh, time axis is actually going downward. So the, uh, the first row here is representing a few segments here. We say W, uh, with the W here we say one, two, three, four, five. So five, W is five, let's say. So that means the first row is really representing five value, where my mouse cursor, first value, second value, third value, fourth value, and five value, right? So five value, and we will be weighting uh, these three, uh, these five value using these scalar values, A1, A2, A3, A5, AW, so A5. So those are the weights. And this is the multiplication, right? So that means the first, row here corresponding to the first five value, you weight them, and then it'll give you Y1. Y1 here is what? Is this in green? So it's actually really sliding across the, your time series. You look at the first W value here is five, so first five value you weigh in some way, it gives you the sixth value. And similarly, if you now you shift the window, we go next, right, the second row, the second row here, you're shifting it by one. So that means you're looking at the next 
five values, and but then again, you want to weight them using A1 to AW, and it gives you Y2, and so on, so on and so forth. Right. So that that is gradual shifting. So the question here, so is what should all this A1 to AW should be, right? Because all the rest of the values are, are, are known, right? So because the whole X matrix is essentially just this, that different way of sliding across, and Y is just the particular value out of it. So nothing, all of them are known, nothing is unknown. The only thing that you don't know is exactly how you want to weigh it. Right? And this is actually the exact same of a linear regression. So uh, here we are, we are looking at how you generate from the, um, from your time series, but uh, in practice, then the, these for linear regression, this won't be a time axis. This would actually be a separate data point, um, and each row would be a dimension. But here, we are how we're reading the dimension in the context of time series. But the actual algorithm is like exactly the same, which also means to solve for a1 to aw, right? How to estimate a1 aw that being the whole vector of a, then you can use the same method, right? With least square fit, you can solve for it exactly. Right, since we know what the X matrix, X matrix is this whole thing, right? Which is all known, all values are known. Then you can solve it exactly. So I transpose times X, then the whole inverse, and then the, and so on. Right. So you can find that exactly. And then the value that you have uh, in matrix is the vector, the minima of root mean square error right, from Y. Right. So that means you'll be able to find this and you know exactly how to weight uh, whatever window you want. What length you want and give you the rest. So that means now you can apply it to, to do a prediction, right? Now with a prediction, what do you do? Where my mouse cursor is, what do you do? Well, you look at the past W value, let's say W is five, the past five value, you multiply it with what you just found, uh, the A vector, and then it gives you the prediction. Right? So exactly the same method as linear regression is the tricky part often is about how you think about, oh, how do you construct the X uh, X matrix, what are the Y matrix, so that's, that's quite different from how you usually use uh, 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 linear regression. Any question for me so far about, how, about linear auto regression? Yeah, basically, using linear regression, um, the method, but then generating the data from the time series data that you're considering, uh, different version, different lagged version, of, of itself. Um, any questions? No question. Okay, so uh, if you are running this on a time series data that you already collected and you don't expect it to really change again, um, then you need to solve it once. So this is quite expensive if your your time series matrix is large, uh, because you'll see there's matrix, multi, uh, matrix multiply and then inverse, right? expensive. And computation-wise, is n times w squared, big O and, and w squared, and storage is n w. So it's like, okay, so not too bad, you pay the price once. However, uh, when you're dealing with time series, it's very common that your data actually change. So that means you get more and more data over time. Um, so then the question is, does it make sense that every time you get new data point, you recompute, you rerun the whole linear regression um, again and again, so that you can update a, the, the weight right, incrementally. Right. So of course you can do it naively, uh, which, which will be expensive. And uh, the better way is to do still compute it, but then you don't pay the heavy price. So uh, using a method called recursive least square, and that allow you to do the expensive matrix inversion, which you will see here. The matrix inversion um, in solving for A, uh, without really doing inversion. Right? So that uh, we, we look at the high level uh, a method of doing it, and the, the, the math is very involved, so we look at the, the high level reason for why we can do that. So the uh, main reason for why you can do it much more computationally uh, efficient, like when we incrementally uh, compute A without really doing matrix inversion is uh, through the observation um, that the X transpose X, which I can go back, X transpose X is this part, right, when you compute on the compute A, you have X transpose X. This is a very expensive thing, right? 
very, very, very big, very expensive. So by observing that this has a special form, take advantage of that so that we only need to do it once so that, that when new data coming in, we, even though the form or the shape of these x transpose and x would change, we don't need to do the full matrix multiply. So that's the main observation. So here we go into a little bit of detail. Right, so xn, our original uh, matrix, right? So we need to compute what x transpose x, uh, transpose x, so very expensive. And now our data has come, keep coming in. So using our, our same uh, 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 representation, we use uh, the vertical axis as time. So that means now we have a new data come in. Instead of xn, now we have one new data point. So that become xn plus one, right? And we have two new data points, n plus two. So again, using naive method, then what do we do? If we will solve for a when there's n x n plus one, then we need to do the whole thing transpose and then multiply with the whole thing. Very expensive. So we say, how how can we just do once, which is doing the multiplication of x n transpose times times x n, and that's it, and then just account for this new row like in a special way, right? So that's exactly the same uh, the main idea. And specifically, we give it a name. So this is the part of the, the formula that we're solving for A. We call this the expensive thing, uh, GN. We call it the gain matrix, right? So if you want to solve for exactly this is, you need to, you still need to do it once, but that, that's okay. We pay, pay for the price once. And as we have new data, right, let's go back here. After new data, so XN become XN plus one, which also means the gain matrix, like this, uh, subscript here will change, so xn plus one transpose xn plus one, right? So this will change. So the question now is how do we compute this gain matrix when the dimension is n plus one from uh, n uh, recursively? Right. So that, that's the, the main idea. Um, and I actually will skip the, we'll have some math, but first tell you that what, in the end, what we get. So if we do, if we do that approach, if we we are able to compute the gain matrix g n plus one from g n incrementally without doing uh, the matrix multiplication. Then huge, the saving is huge. So this method we call the recursive least square. So by comparison, the new method would be big O w square instead of big O, n times w. So n is uh, usually much larger than w. w is the window size, right? so much smaller than, than n. So significant saving um, in the size, and also for computation as well. So this is very dramatic. Um, for asking incremental computation, and each time the new data come in, then you only need to do what? w squared versus n times w squared. So, uh, very dramatic because usually n is what we're talking time series, a lot of values, and window size could be what, between one to 100, so much smaller but then this times million, right, million scale, that is, that is a pretty dramatic uh, saving, right? So this is what you could get if you're able to get uh, the gain matrix n plus one from the previous uh, gain matrix when n uh, gn. So now we can look at a little math. Uh, you will want to study it closer at home because pretty scary math. Um, so you can express it, the gain matrix, n plus one, um, actually mainly as a, a multiplication of a few things. Uh, so gn is the previous, uh, you still need to compute it, you still need to compute it once, but then the rest you can express it into mainly the result of the previous, then times mainly vector, vector, and then this is also a vector, and uh, so, where the uh, matrix here, a little scary thing here, um, also mainly is vector times uh, matrix times vector. Right? So if you do apply this into our original uh, scary form of uh, uh, what we are doing generally, so this is to solve it exactly, then you can look at the dimension of it. So the your a vector, the vector you want to solve for, uh, is w times w w plus n n times w and so on all these dimension. Um, you can find out the expensive part uh, come from the first one, right? The matrix transpose, 
and also the uh, matrix multiplication, and then the inverse. Right, so all these applying very, very quickly. Let's extract all this part down to the uh, gain matrix. Gain matrix then it becomes a W type by W. And the reason is that uh, the way that you can write it out as a product of other component uh, using the, the gain matrix at N. And all these are not that big as the original, uh, which is in the order of N times something else, right? N times W, for example. And particularly this one that you think, that, ah, so there's an inverse C and scalar. So this is actually a scalar. So all these, so because once you do the multiplication, uh, multiply into it, and then they become one scalar. So that means all these things that you're looking at originally, uh, you may think that you need to do a matrix, matrix multiplication, but if you do, do the ex, uh, express it, uh, uh, write it out, then you can do the internal multiplication carefully uh, by turning uh, these matrix vector multiplication into a scalar. And once you turn into a scalar, well, then it's great because then the rest is essentially to the order of W by W. So that gives you a lot of the, the saving that we see. So uh, hard to go through it in, in, uh, in class unless we really write it on the, on the whiteboard, uh, but the details are um, all there. You can, you can read, uh, go through it, do some, use some, I suggest use some small matrices to, to look at it and it's ah, okay, so that makes sense. So main idea, again, express uh, the game matrix using the previous one, uh, which is much smaller and they do it once, and, and whenever you have new data that coming out incrementally, you only pay a small price. <laughs> Excuse me. Right, so that is uh, the saving that you can, can get. So instead of an big O N W, you can do big O N, uh, big O W squared. So in practice, what it's really doing, right? So something, you likely you are losing something if you're doing something incrementally into solving exactly, right? So pictorially, what's really happening? So if you solve exactly, you have all these uh, data points. So it's a, these you can think of the, the lag plot, right? So if you solve it exactly, you do a perfect fit. And now you have a new data point, then what do you do? If you do it, solve it exactly, then you might tilt it a little bit, right? You might tilt the line a little bit and that is what, what uh, recursive least square is trying to do. So it's by using as much as possible of the previous or existing line, and then may need to tilt it a little bit so that it can account for the new point. Right. And the nice thing about this approach is that uh, it also come with uh, ability to, we call it, forget the older examples. Um, so in practice is that you, don't really, a lot of times we actually don't want to solve for the fit uh, exactly uh, in a situation like this. So I see you have data point, okay, going along the trend, but then something changed, dramatic change, right? And then the new data point actually looks like this. So just, just eyeballing, you know, well, I actually don't want to solve it exactly. If you solve it exactly, well, then it's not a really a good fit. So uh, by able to do that, um, incrementally by setting how much you want to uh, take into account of the past. So recursive least square will actually gradually go along that trend so that in the, the fit, you're actually forgetting the past. So we call that recursive least square with forgetting, without forgetting. So they control how much of the past that you, you're willing to throw, throw away. Um, so that's also also pretty, pretty nice, a nice feature for doing the incremental method where if you want to solve it exactly, then you need to think about, okay, exactly how far you, you want to throw away from, from the path. Yeah. So any, any question for me so far about um, linear autoregression and um, also the recursive least square method, so which now we do the incremental computation. No questions. Okay, today pretty quiet, maybe too cold. Okay, so we're gonna stop here today and um, continue on Tuesday. So remind everyone again, Tuesday, next Tuesday and Thursday are la the last two classes um, before Thanksgiving, uh, because on the Thanksgiving week on Tuesday, we don't have class. And then after Thanksgiving, you come back and that will be the poster session.
Okay, I'll see you guys next week. So where we look at last time was time series also, right? we, something we call uh, linear forecasting. And we learn about how to use a small, uh, tiny, tiny variant of linear regression and uh, apply it for uh, during time, time series analysis. And, and we will have a quiz today, yes. Um, so that's why you're getting the card in the, in the back. And um, so the main idea in uh, linear forecasting using linear regression is, is what? So you clone your clone yourself, right? And so you have your own time series. You you have multiple versions of yourself, which is a, we kind of like a lagged behind um, kind of version. And for that, we, we have the lag plot. And that's just the kind of lagged version of data uh, that we use to help to do that linear regression. And um, one big thing uh, about you doing linear regression is that we do need to buy into the assumption that somehow our linear assumption is uh, correct. Right, so not all the time that 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 would hold. So which is why we also have the nonlinear forecasting method dealing with um, sometimes we call seemingly like chaotic uh, um, kind of signals. Right, so we'll look at some of these methods uh, from from research, and we'll look at some example chaotic uh, data, like what we mean by chaotic and how we're going to handle them. Right, so we look at the. The problem first, the main idea, uh, what a specific method we're going to use, and also look at some result. So nonlinear uh, forecasting, or the kind of problem that you may often be looking at would be something like this. I mean, there are many, many variations, of course. Um, so these you often say, oh, wow, going up and down, a lot of things, even whatever scale you're looking at it, it still look uh, pretty random. Um, and if you do apply our linear regression method, or the uh, linear auto regression method, if you would, on this, and it would it wouldn't work. So you can try construct a lag plot, for example, on this, and you try to fit a line, it doesn't work. And why does it not work exactly? Because a linear linearity assumption doesn't hold. So remember, a linearity assumption was was what that uh, the point that you want to predict. Somehow you can express it as a linear combination of previous points. Right? So not always always work. So then, um, how do we solve that? So this, I think, often I would say is the, the best example, kind of also at the end of the, the, the semester also, uh, to show you all the things that you have learned before. Um, and we are combining it in an in a interesting way to solve this problem. So exactly to deal with what we call nonlinear forecasting a problem. And main idea is to use uh, lag plot, which you learned about yesterday. Uh, not yesterday, uh, today's what? Tuesday, last Thursday. And then also apply uh, near, nearest neighbor search, which you also learn about the classification. Okay, so how does that work? So this is a uh, simple, like one version, one uh, lag behind, one time cell lag behind version of, of our cell that we call the lag plot. So exactly the same thing you saw last time on Thursday. And vertical axis here is uh, at time t, and then horizontal axis here is at t minus 1. So how you read it is if you have a point here, um, on the vertical axis here, you can look at what the current value is currently. You can think of it. Right? And then horizontal axis is the value um, one time step before. And you can do that for all the data points. So this is nothing different, exactly the same as previous uh, previous method. And again, like visually, you can look at if you, you apply uh, a linear regression here, the, f the fit is not very good. You can say fit one line, like 2D, so there will be a line. You fit it here, then it, it's quite a little bit of error. Um, so how do we solve this problem? So let's say you have a new point come in. Right? A new point come in, let's say, it's over here, right? And then, so there's x t minus one. So that means we presume this is what's happening, what what we have, and we will predict in the future the next time set, which is x, x t. So the question is, if the current time point uh, value is this, what should the next point be? Right. So we say, well, we don't have a line, we cannot really fit a line. So so now what do we do? 
So solution is very simple. We apply k nearest neighbor. Um, so we always say k is four. So four nearest neighbor. So what do we do is, given the input point, then you say what are the four closest uh, neighbor. So here we say four. Again, same as k nearest neighbor. If there's uh, k is four, then you look at four. If k is five, you look at five. So here we look at four, and you find the, the nearest of them. And then you look at all the future value, right? the future value. And what do we do? We can do uh, interpolation. You can do average. You can do median. You can do, do any other thing, other interpolation method. And that becomes your prediction. And actually, that's all. So if you want to do nonlinear forecasting, that's a great way to do it. And you would say, well, why would it work? Right? So if you think about it conceptually, here we actually sort of like fitting things, but at a local level, where if you are using linear auto regression, what do you do? You fit a whole line, and the whole line, you, need, you want that line to be applicable for all data points. While here, we say, well, if we cannot fit a whole line for all data points, why don't we just look at what's happening locally? So that's the main intuition. So you're not really fitting the whole thing, but really locally. And often the assumption here is, well, things that are close by probably more relevant, so which is exactly what's happening here. So of course, uh, even the method that, that, uh, that's, that looks simple, uh, there's still a lot of consideration. Right? So everything is simple in hindsight. So you say, oh, that is simple. Uh, Quite a few things. Same thing as uh, previously, we, we look at linear auto regression. There's also the window, how, how much further in the past that we want to look at. That means the lag, right? So previously, we look at lag is one, right? Just looking at one time step, but again, you can extend it to lag is two, three, four, and so on. So, uh, and the second question there is what is k? Like, as in k nearest neighbor, why k is four, why k is five, and so on. How many neighbor? Um, also, interpretation. Interpolation, sorry, interpolation. What should we do? Should we do uh, average? Should we do median? Should we do uh, quantiles and so on? Right? And all of these combined, they said, well, quite a few parts already. So why should it work at all? Um, so that's the kind of overall question. So why should it work at all? So it turned out uh, for for lag, uh, you can look at you, you do need to try, um, but generally around, around that range, 10, 16, 15, uh, that seems to be pretty well. So that means your nearest neighbor, you don't need to look very, very, very far away. If you really look at nearest neighbor across the whole thing, then you're kind of averaging, averaging out across the whole data point. So close enough, but not, not too far. And then about 16 seems to work for this particular application. And for uh, nearest neighbor also, and uh, also, don't need, need to look a lot, but the thing is, this is hyperparameter, so you do need to try. And as we mentioned many times before, how do you pick these hyperparameter? Uh, well, look at what are the tasks that you want to solve. And uh, best way is to determine uh, effectiveness is look at how, how all these different parameters will help you solve your task effectively. Right? So uh, k, k nearest neighbor, uh, k is about one to 10, not, not, not very high. And for interpolation, uh, Quite a few weights, so most common average. Let's see it. And uh, this is where you want to do probably some uh, data visualization to look at the distribution. So you look at, oh, this is about normal distributed. Well, then that probably makes sense to use average. But if it's really skewed, then maybe you want to consider median. And, and these you do need to try. So only something called weighted average. Things that are more uh, closer to the midpoint, you weigh them more further uh, away, then you don't weigh as much. And the almost more sophisticated method. Um, so this is really doing like a local fit. So you can actually do SVD. But remember one way of using SVD is what? You're essentially finding a, a axis to project your data on. So you can do SVD just locally on those nearest neighbor that you have selected. Right? So no one's stopping you from, from doing that. So, so that's one way to find, a, find the axis. But all of these really uh, different methods, like what is it really doing is, is trying to, to find some kind of, of summarization uh, in the local neighborhood. So that when you have a new point, you do a fit, in this case using SVD, you find a good projection axis, and then you can do the read. Right? Or you just do uh, a gradient, uh, uh, average, right? collapsing everything into one single point. Um, so that's all different, different, um, different methods. So there are some theory behind it. So you say, oh, well, so that seems to me magical. So does it work? So there, there are ways to do it. And it's uh, a famous algorithm called Taken's uh, theory, and essentially it says that if there's a long enough delay vector, delay vector as in our case, the lag uh, version of ourselves, then we can do prediction. 
Um, so even if there is an absurd variable. So um, often this is more in the, in the case of dynamical system. Um, so that means there are some uh, dynamics and sometimes the physics that governing the, the situation that you would get. So there, there is some theoretical foundation behind it. Right, so look at uh, nonlinear forecasting method. Right, nonlinear forecasting, and so all sounds very good. So, what does it really work? Like, if you apply on data, real data, uh, does it really work? So, I can look at some kind of chaotic uh, data point or data data set. Right. So, this one we saw in the very beginning of the class ago. So, a lot of up and down, up and down. You could do the uh, linear auto regression method, then it doesn't really work. So in red here is the real data point, and in green here is what um, the real thing is, right? so prediction. Right? So in green, and uh, question is how well do these predictions work? So now we'll look at the prediction comparing to the real thing. So here, um, let's see, yes. So if we'll compare, look at it, just zoom in a little bit, you will see it's actually pretty good. So mostly up and down, you got it right. And then there's also uh, a little bit of a gap, of course. So that seems pretty magical. There's a, mm, you're just uh, by chance, you got it well. So what about the other data sets? So these are uh, data from, this is modeling convection currents in the air. So these are generated by real physical systems uh, and something that looks like this. Okay, it doesn't look good. So uh, if you do apply, the uh, method, a simple method, right? lag plot plus k nearest neighbor, what do we see? So again, in red, the real thing, real thing, and then you have the, uh, the in green. So if you do zoom in, also pretty good. So almost perfect. They say, well, it's still lucky. So let's look at another one. Uh, laser, fluctuation in laser over time. Uh, and then, wow, something like, look like that. No way you can do it. Actually, this is actually a good example uh, to get you more intuition of why does it work. So if you look at, these, you will see, oh, quite a bit of uh, re repetition. Actual repetition for our case is good. If you do zoom in, it's almost perfect. And you can say, why is it looking so well? Why is it, why is, why is it so perfect? Right, so actually that's a good, good question for you. for you. This is uh, more tricky. So now you can think about, think about all these, like all the, all the methods, all the data that you've seen. So why does it work so well? So let's let's jump back to our original example, right? So we're saying that we'll get these like lagged version of data points that could be multiple lagged, like lagged by one, lagged by two, lagged by three, and then each data point here would be would be those kind of high dimensional. Uh, data point, and then we'll, what did we say? We do k nearest neighbor, find the closest, do interpolation to get a prediction. Right? So that's it, the main method. So lag plot plus k nearest neighbor to prediction. So now going back to our real data. So why does this idea work so well? Yes. Oh, uh, the question is why is lag equal? Where, where does lag equal to one come into play? So. Uh, actually, these these two axes here. So xt is one version, like you can think of its own own data point, and then xt minus one is just shifted by one. So you can have xt minus two, which is shifted by two. Uh, then then in that case, that will be a three D right, three dimension. If you also include xt minus three, then you have four dimension. If you include t minus five, then four. Then you have five dimension. Yeah. So and then having having more and more of the older version. Yeah. Okay, so, so this is the, the simple method, right? So now we can look at the real data. So why does that work so well? Why does that work so well? So what are we really doing here now if we apply that method? Actually, see if I can copy. Let me copy that from here. to here. Okay, 
So that's, that's quite easy to see. Zoom it. Yes. So, why does this method work so well here? I mean, in order to think about it, let's say we want to make a prediction at where my mouse cursor is. What is it really doing? So, if it, where my mouse cursor is, like this high point, so that means this is where a new data point is, right? So, so what are we what are we really doing? So, in our our workflow was what we want to find nearest neighbor, right? Other points that are similar, similar to where my data point is, right? And then do interpolation and give the new one. So what is, what is really happening? Why does it work so well? Many some thinking. Because the line is continuous, um, e yes. In this case, it's yes, but not necessarily need to be continuous for the for this to work. Right? So there's a number of key concepts. Like one is the idea that you're looking at lag version. So that means when you do a prediction, you want to look at what happened immediately before, maybe one step, two steps, three steps, and so on. Right, so that's one thing, looking at a lag version. And the other is you're using nearest neighbor. You want to find similar things. So that means in our case, that means you are finding in the past how many other similar examples, examples similar to what you want to make the prediction for. Yes? Mm -hmm. It almost always does the exact same drop mm -hmm. down to like 25. Mm -hmm. You don't have any big spread in the different ways that a given value changes in the next time step. Mm -hmm. So that's a very consistent signal. Very good. Yes. Very good. So that's exactly what happened. And when, whenever you see that like k-nearest neighbor or finding similar thing, that really means you are looking at things in the past. Right? So in the past, what a similar thing. So in the time series, situation, this example, exactly what are we doing? Let's say we're trying to make a prediction at this, this red line here, right, vertical line at this point. What are we really doing when we're looking at, let's say, past four similar, like four nearest neighbor? What we're really doing is actually you're going in the past, where my mouse cursor, this is one similar example, and then you go to look at another one, this is another similar example, and then the other similar example, the other similar example. So those are your immediate four nearest neighbor. And then for each of them, what are we doing? Well, it depends on how much lag you want to look at. That means how much uh, further data point in the past it, uh, uh, where my mouse cursor is. So if you want to look at just one more, then probably like down here. If you look at another one, further down, another lag further down. So essentially, you're taking out these segments from the past, segments on the past, similar to exactly where you want to make your prediction. So another way to think about it, if you're actually really reading, more or less reading in the past, like what is similar, what is the length of segment? Lag is corresponding to how many data points, what's the length of segment uh, in the past you want to look at. And you want all these segments to be similar, as many as possible. In this case, I, the reason I said why this is a good example is exactly because of periodic. So it's pretty easy to, to really pick out. If you say, I want to make a prediction like where my mouse cursor is at this point. So you can just go around and then go, go in the past and oh, there's one here, there's another one, another one, another one. You're really, really pulling out all those, all those examples, which is why the um, prediction is so good. So prediction, um, all this is perfect because they, a lot of periodic, you can find almost exactly the same shape in the past and you just read them all. Yes, a question. How do we line up the time? A line up the, you mean in prediction? Oh, so how do we line up the time? Ah, so I uh, need to have time step. So actually you will collapse. So let's say um, we use lag is one. So that means just 2D. So that means either look at 
the current time point and also the previous uh, time point. So, so that means we turn each of these two, let's say this is one over here, my mouse cursor at the tip, and then the previous one. So that become, these two values become one point here. And you do that for every, every two points. So let's give it a name. This is one, this is two. So one, two become one point. Two and three become another point. Three and four become another point. So that's how you generate the, the, lag, uh, the lag plot here. And of course, if lag is two, let's say, right? So that means we want every triplet to be one term. That means like one, two, three, that collapses into one point. One, two, three, another two, uh, one point, and so on. So, so, so that means that you don't really need to know the absolute time point, but you, for every triplet, every uh, three thing, you turn it, turn it in. And of course, you adjust the lag. You can have longer lag. Let's say ten. Lag is ten. Um, then that means it's a, a segment of ten points. So essentially, you're turning all these, extract all the segment, all the segment, turning all these points. The more times you see. See, th see that, the better. If it's periodic, like uh, uh, repetitive, the better. The more, the more you see it, then that also what makes Kanye's neighbor uh, work so well. So there's, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, multiple thing going in, but you, you see the technical approach is pretty simple, right? As in how you, how you extract all these uh, signals, how they put them in a plot, how you do the uh, Kanye's neighbor. So all these individual components are pretty simple, uh, but then the conceptual uh, method of oh, how do you use them at the right time? So that's the that's the innovation. Yeah, is it any any question? Is it clear? So this is um, you can do it by hand. Actually, I think something to improve for next semester is. Uh, we can actually show some numerical value. So you can actually draw your own, uh, construct your own time series, and then construct your own uh, lag plot also. Um, right? You can simple values, right? and, and, and see if you can do, do the same thing, right? you're applying this very simple Kinetics neighbor to a readout. Um, yeah. So this is the, the easiest to see, and similar to for the previous one too. Right? So these are why is it so good? Because you can see from the previous um, value so okay yeah so a simple idea uh, but work pretty well yes so then more paper you can read about it how to, how to do all these Maybe I can skip this one so there's more of a summary um, so so far what we what they look at for the time series uh, segment. So we have look at some of the uh, core concepts that when you talk about doing time series analysis, often what, what are we doing? So the first thing you do need to look at what are the similarity functions that you're applying on, and you would want to consider uh, time warping, so as in a stretched or, or uh, a spread out version of each other. So uh, sometimes it could be uh, talking about the same thing as in you say, saying a word slower or faster. Um, so we want to take into account that, that uh, uh, stretching and compression. And we'll talk about the uh, linear autoregression, a small modification of uh, linear regression but on time series. And main thing is to construct a lag, a lag plot and then do linear regression. And then just now we talk about a nonlinear forecasting method, um, mostly using lag plots but use uh, k nearest neighbor. And the, the trick there is to, to look at how many examples from previous uh, case that you, you can look at. So um, that's an uh, uh, I think a great example for why Kanye's neighbor in practice could work so well um, is that that when you have enough similar uh, data point in the past, and um, then then it could do very well. Like it doesn't need to doesn't need to be very fancy. Uh, just say look at what the what the more so similar neighbor, and then uh, read from there. So we'll switch here a little bit to. Um, the visualization of time series. So now Apple start much higher, uh, a little outdated. And so whenever people talk about visualizing time series, often they'll think, well, oh, some kind of line chart, right? Some kind of line chart and uh, measure individual values. But 
by now, so you already seen many uh, visualization example, not just for time series, but also for other data. So very often is you, you don't uh, just want to show the raw value as in a particular time point, um, but you may also want to show uh, different views of the data. So in this case, we are showing uh, the, the data across time, right? And here we're showing uh, one day and two day, and also uh, down below we show even higher resolution. So you have, I'm sorry, uh, lower resolution. So as in uh, at the year view, 2017, 2016, and so on. So this is actually a very common way of we, we do like looking at the overview and you allow people to zoom in and then select the particular statement, a uh, zoom in filter, and then detail on demand could be you mouse over a particular data point or you mouse it, in this case, there's uh, some significant event, so you can click on it and then it will, it will show up the detail. Okay, let me switch view. And so time series, uh, thanks to it being so, such a popular kind of data set, so there are a lot of tools that you can already use there. Um, you were thinking about just using existing tools or you don't, you don't want to build things that you, you exactly what you fit, uh, what you want uh, fit, fit your use, then you can just use them. So there's one um, called Google Public Data Explorer. So it's originally called GetMiner, they, uh, they acquired it. And so which is why, um, you can just now go and use it, so part of Google. Um, we actually saw a little bit of it in the, uh, in the tech talk uh, delivered by uh, Professor Hans Roslin. So that's the time series over time. I'm sorry, uh, population over time. And then uh, what you just saw, uh, the annotated time, so it will be component like this. So it's from Google chart available. And oops, oh, you're zooming. Can assume, right? So something like this. So here down below, you can do the do the zooming and panning, and you can also add uh, do a different kind of zooming out to one, three months, one month, so on, and also you can add the event, right? So these are, are nice when this is exactly what you need. You see, there's some function, some configuration possibility, but overall. You, this would be would be the component that that you will be using. So um, again, same same reason for why you may want to learn uh, programming or building or visualizing to is well, there will be time that this this is not sufficient or they may be a little tricky of in incorporating this. Um, in that case, then you do need to think about how to how to build your own. Um, so there are also other components that uh, were pretty popular. So something called Timeline from the MIT uh, Simile Project. So you can look at this. A similar kind of structure, horizontal time. You will see that uh, time is very commonly uh, laid out horizontally. And there's more people are more used to do, doing it. But we will look at one exception, exception where uh, time is actually vertical. But for now, this is, this is horizontal. And this is helpful for visualizing event over time. So you have the uh, slider underneath, and then this at the event at the top. And if you click on it, again, you can show details. Um, this is talking about assassination, right? So you can mouse over it. So this is, again, a whole component. So you do need to use the whole thing. Either you use it or you don't use it. And then another one, also from the same project. Right, so actually quite similar to, to the Google one. Um, so you can also uh, mouse over a multiple time series on it and if you click on it, again, you can see the details. And uh, doing these uh, charting in Excel, often people overlook it. Um, you can actually create really high quality chart even from Excel. So Excel pretty flexible, you can do a lot of configuration. And um, so actually sometimes like for uh, paper publications, it could be created from Excel and then export as PDF and import it into paper. So if those do not fit uh, your use, so then you do need to create your own. Um, so you already know the hardest way, which is using D3, or you do use, use uh, Java, then JP chart. So the power of being able to do programming is that you can do whatever you want. So there's no, no more limitation. Um, 
but if you say, okay, we do need to do a lot of configuration, but mostly we just want to use existing things. So there are some good libraries out there. Um, oops. There's one called cross filter. Not sure you have seen it, so you can take a look. So cross filter originally just were a part of square or rainbow. Hopefully it still work. Yes. Ah, okay, it still work. So uh, when you have, um, you probably have seen this in let's see, a uh, website like Kayak, for example. They have multiple filter, multiple distribution of data that you may want to filter. Usually it's for like, oh, you want to find um, flights that start at a certain time, land at a certain time, price range at a certain time. Then you might see something like this. So it calls cross filter because uh, you can do filtering at all the different chart, and then it will show you the intersection of all these. So cross filter and then they expand, then you can see all the all the value down there. Right. So this is kind of in the middle. So there's individual component, but it's tied to your, your data point. And uh, it's not one big component that you have to use or not use. Uh, so in the middle, so you can you can integrate that into your application also. Right. So um, by now, at the end of the semester, so hopefully everyone is uh, uh, convinced that just using automa automated method um, not enough. So there are many cases that visualization uh, will be helpful. Right. So so human often want to ask different kind of questions that uh, algorithms or automated automated methods may not be able to, to answer. So as some something as simple as saying, is there a pattern? So machine learning are great. If you know exactly what pattern you might be looking for, then it can probably help you find a lot. But there's also many patterns that computers just don't know. Uh, it may make sense, make a lot of sense to human beings, but but not immediately clear to computer. So in those cases, then you do need to support human exploration. But some other tasks, however, uh, computer much better at it. There's no reason in forcing people to do it. For example, like finding what is the greatest value, the smallest value. Right. So these you can easily compute. You don't need human being to do it. Right? Um, on the other hand, for something like are these two things similar, two time series sim similar, that could be tricky, right? So in a perfect world, then yes, you have two things that really going up and down at the same time. But in practice, you rarely see two time series that are really fully in sync. So that also means that uh, your time series uh, similarity function, you may not always get um, get to see to that, that perfect match, right? So, um, so there are a lot of the tasks that uh, still require humans uh, uh, intuition and input um, to solve that. Right. So there's a there are quite a quite a quite a number of them. So here's a good example of showing uh, you where uh, you do need to make integrate some human intuition. Where if you just ask computer, they're probably not able to tell you very well. So this is a a chart a water consumption uh, chart doing called Olympic gold medal hockey game. So we have two days of data. In green is on February 27, the day before the hockey game, Olympic ho hockey game. And then in blue is the water consumption on the day of the hockey game. So in blue. So over time, horizontal axis over time, vertical axis water consumption. And on the day of the hockey game, doesn't look well. Doesn't look very normal. So it's a little high, higher than normal, higher than the previous day, and then it's very low. And then there's some peaks, really high, and then low again. Really high, really low, high, low, and then a little spike, and then come down, and then ooh, very high. So questions for you all. So why are there peaks? Yes. Yes, so there's, there are bricks. What bricks? Why bricks? Yes, in the back. Commercials, but how is commercial related to water consumption? Very good. Everyone needs to go to the toilet. So we're human beings. We ask the computer, wait, why do we see more water? Well, we don't know. So uh, I doubt any computer would, would consider uh, what the what people really need. So you hold you hold off, like face off, so you, everyone, no one go to the bathroom, and then, oh, okay, it's commercial, everyone go there, and then come back. So actually, pretty predictable. Um, 
and some people even hold for the uh, the medal ceremony. Yes, and then you, everyone go to the toilet. Um, so interesting example, um, but this is telling you that well, a lot of times there there are things that make pretty easy sense like uh, to, to people. Like we have common sense. We know well usually in a commercial. What do you do? You you leave your seat. You get you have something to eat. You go to the bathroom. Right? But computer don't really know those. Um, so there are also some uh, some of the tools that are particularly helpful. I already seen that uh, we already seen that a lot in uh, in some other projects. So it's one is called uh, game chart, useful for project. Um, so you can still think about integrating that in your your final report, or just to play with it and just try it. So it's helpful in in that it can show you both all your tasks. So usually you uh, encode them as each role in your data, uh, in your in a uh, visualization, and then uh, vertical uh, each column usually is time. So so horizontal for time is pretty common, so you don't want to break that break that uh, convention. And uh, you can use the bar to visualize how much of their work is completed, what is remain, and also look at the current time as well. So, so usually it's pretty complete and pretty clear. Uh, you have all your information. You can also look at the dependencies uh, between tasks, like what are the tasks are overlapping, which one would fin need to finish first before the other uh, would, would start. So this is a, a good visualization. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in Excel, it doesn't really have something built in, so there is, I think, a, a tool or a way that you can make it, uh, but it's not a default function set uh, in Excel. There are also some other uh, tools that are less used uh, or not commonly uh, provided, but probably pretty helpful. So one tool is called uh, Time Searcher, so it, it came out from a, a research project um, to allow you to search for a time series. Uh, so the main idea is that you draw boxes, uh, draw boxes in a line chart, and then for the time series that pass through the boxes that you draw, then those get queried. So what does that mean? Like for example, here um, in the cyan color, so this is what the user would, would draw. And horizontal axis, again, it is this time, vertical axis, you can think of like stock prices. So what you're really doing is that well, I want only uh, time series that pass through this particular day range, this particular range of value, and to only include those. So this is what, what's happening. And um, in the background, you say, why is there some gray, gray thing? So the gray thing is actually a histogram. Uh, darker means more lines uh, going through it. Lighter means fewer lines go through it. So that's just showing, I mean, showing the overview of some sort in the background uh, and also providing the details in the front end. So that is coming from the Maryland group. And you can extend the idea that the times uh, boxes, these searching boxes, you can have multiple of them. So you can do actually end query. Um, for example, you say, I only want um, time sheets that pass through these two boxes, right? Only those two. So, so that's a pretty interesting uh, an idea. So a final example, and uh, so we have seen all the example before they were using horizontal axis for time. And generally we don't want to break it, but there are times that we need to break uh, the convention. So this is a the tool called GeoTime. So it actually won quite a number of awards uh, in, the, in the 2000. Um, so we look at a short video, like why do we break, break, the, uh, break the rule? Actually I need um, audio. So Marcus, I'm gonna try to play some audio. We need to see things like movement patterns. The third source of location information that we're gonna bring in is gonna be images taken by the mobile device. These images are often geocoded with GPS tags. From the root directory of the logical extraction, I'm going to choose PDF, Files, and Image Directory, and choose Folder of Photos from within GeoTime. This is going to allow me to open up all of the photos taken by the handset and merge them into my existing data. Now we have all of the images that have been merged into our viewer. Here you can see the playback of these images over time. Let's take a look at this batch of images that were. Okay, so this is an example where you see the, the reason that time is now vertical is because the map is horizontal. Actually, this is like, uh, 
2D plus 3D, so you have the map in the, at the bottom, and a vertical axis is actually uh, time, and, and also it's using vertical space in this, this case for showing images, right? So that means this is looking at a person uh, walking along uh, some sort of a, a path, and for each of the, the time point, then it's a picture, so you're showing the picture, um, and to help with uh, occlusions, so we actually put the, the picture like all lined up um, in the, at the top, so the easier to see. So this is a uh, a good example of showing like sometimes you do need to break it, break the rules, um, because you do need to show uh, the the map there, um, which is taking the, the the plane, and then time do need to go um, vertically. Yeah. Okay, so. Those are all the examples I'd like to show for uh, for time series. 